who are you? Uh, my name is Eric Campbell. I am a host and a storyteller and a show developer for tabletop RPGs. What are the three things you value most in life? Three things I value most, probably compassion, a sense of self, the ability to uh, be mindful of oneself and one's like own behaviors. And um, fellowship, I think, would be the three. As cheesy as that all sounds. Mm, why fellowship? I've never heard anyone describe. I haven't seen fellowship outside of a book. Actually, what do you mean by fellowship? <laughs> um, fellowship is, this is something that I've only become aware of in the past few years, uh, coinciding with my going professional as a dungeon master and a storyteller is just, um, you know, I've lived in Los Angeles for 20 years and I came out here originally to be an actor. And over the course of that time, I've kind of watched a lot of people that I knew from high school that we thought we were going to be close until the day we died kind of drift away. And even, even, even more recently, um, I've watched, you know, very close friends who I, I was certain that like I was in the family kind of drift away. And it's not anybody's fault in particular. It can be life just pulling people away or, or personalities change or dynamic changes or whatever. But what I've discovered in contrast to these events happening throughout the course of the past 20 years is one of the things that gaming has taught me is how precious and wonderful it is to have your friends, that group, that group of friends. Um, that uh, it's, it's like a, the Cheers theme song where everybody knows your name kind of thing. That, that, that whole bit. I've come to value that so much, especially during the pandemic, really kind of underlines how important it is to have your mates and uh, to get you, you know, through the day, and get by with a little help from your friends. That's kind of where I, that, that's definitely been one of the things that has fallen as one of the most important things in my life. When I was like, uh, when I was a young kid, I didn't, really have many friends and the more i got into my latter teenage years uh, and because i had like stuff at school and everything like that i just kind of the importance of having people that you know for a fact will have your back no matter yeah. what and I, it is painful to see like friends drift away or sometimes when you have to disengage from a friendship because it yeah. is yeah it, it like the <laughs> dynamic has changed in such a way that it, it kind of breaks you mm -hmm. to to kind of continually hang out with that person or vice versa. Some people, you know, will say like, actually, I don't think this is going to be good. Uh, and that sucks, but unfortunately people change. Uh, yeah. So that fellowship thing, it's not something I'd ever considered, but I suppose, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great answer. Thank you. Tell me a memory which shaped you. I mean, it, this always jumps to my mind when I get asked something similar to this because of how relevant it is with what I'm doing. But I, I, this one has been coming up a lot uh, in the past couple of years, but my, my grandfather, he had such a strange, he was kind of a hoarder. I, I didn't understand what that was when I was a kid. I just thought it was cool that he collected everything. Um, and he used to hit up any garage sale he could get, you know, he saw that was happening. I once, I, I'll never forget, he was driving me home from a water park. This is back when we lived in Texas. And I was a little boy, and it was one of the rare times where I got to spend a week with my grandparents. And I'll never forget, he pulled over on the side of the road because he saw a plastic bucket. And he didn't want to let that go to waste. So he, he pulled over on the side of the highway and, and grabbed up this plastic bucket and put it into the car. And, and I was just like, what the hell? Like, I was only like seven or six. But that's the kind of man he was. And he started hoarding like a bunch of stuff. And he would like, he would hoard... He had newspapers, his office. I'll never forget the smell of his office. I used to love that office. It was this small space, and it was floor to ceilings with shelves that were just packed with newspapers. He just saved every newspaper. And as a result, the office had that magical, like, old paper smell that bookstores have when you walk in. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, it's, and, and so I associated that smell with that quiet, soft carpeted office and that strange desk that he had in the corner with the glass covering over the top and the old crickety, like, leather green office chair that leaned back so far that you always thought you were going to fall. And I used to listen to, like, my dinosaur tapes in that office. And <laughs> I, I would go in there and just, like, I would put in, like, in my Fisher-Price cassette player, I would just, like, put in, like, <laughs> dinosaur tapes and, and time travel tapes. And it became, I was never supposed to be in there, but it became another world for me. 
and it was sort of like my portal into this n- the next dimension. And it was interesting to me because one day while I was playing in there and I shouldn't have been in there, he walked in with a box and caught me. And instead of yelling at me, he reached into the box and he pulled out a cassette tape. He had just come back from a garage sale. <laughs> and so, uh, so he had another box of crap. And he put out a, pulled out a cassette tape and he told me, he goes, I got this for you. And he handed it to me. And I looked at it. And on the label were three things I had never read before in my life uh, in consecutive order. And it read Star Trek The Motion Picture, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek Three: The Shirt Search for Spock. And Hell yeah! I I went. Uh, he led me into the next room, and he popped in the VHS and just started playing it. And I think he was trying to keep me out of his office, but what he didn't realize what he was doing was he had just ignited my life. He had no. The man had no idea that he had just put a booster rocket on this kid's brain. And um, I I have I I when I moved to LA, I grabbed a box of personal stuff because I'm very, very sentimental. And so I grabbed a bunch of stuff from high school so I could carry it with me so I could always look back if I needed to. And that VHS tape is still with me. I still have it in my box. Um, And it is one of my most guard, it's like like a talisman, like I guard it. (laughs) It is basically what set me on to the path of like loving sci-fi and fantasy and everything. What's your favorite color? Um, I've only just recently discovered it. (laughs) Because I... I kept, just, I kept just thinking, like, oh, I'm one of these people that can't make up their mind between blue and green. But when I, when I uh, launched the League of Whimsy, which is sort of like the own, like, personal brand that I've got going to, like, give people a place to know where they can go to support me. Uh, originally, we had launched a Patreon. And I was trying to find, like, I was like, oh, God, I got to personalize this. Like, who am I? Like, I got to find myself in colors or some shit. And, and I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And... So I kept going through like all the things that really appealed to me and I ended up going back again and again and again to this like color palette that I could not find a name for. But it's like the way I kept describing it to people is I was like, you know, the Simic Guild and Magic the Gathering, that color palette's just amazing. Like, I love that one. I don't know what it is. And thankfully, we have so many artist friends in the community. They actually told me what the hell the name of it is. So it's like Seafoam Green, I guess, Mm -hmm. where it's like this strange gradient of blue and green this beautiful gradient of blue and green so that's i'm like yeah of course that's gonna be me i'm like a hipster or something but that's definitely my favorite color i'm gonna google seafoam green because i think yeah. i know the one you're about and it's not hipster to have speci- uh, specific colors uh, yeah that's true oh wow yeah that's lovely it's very soft it's I, calming it's a calming color yeah it's kind of there's and, and like the, the Magic the Gathering, that, that, that guild in M- MTG, it, it has like this gradients to it that I was like, I don't know what that is, but that's what I love. Yeah, that's, that's, my, favorite color. that's my specific brand of bullshit right there. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> yeah. Tell me in as much detail as you can about something you knew of which once existed and now does not. <laughs> that would be bubble yum soda. Bubble gum everyone- soda? Yes, I, everyone, would ins- everyone gags when I tell them about this, but I will never forget there was one summer right when the 80s was clicking over into the 90s, and uh, we had just moved into our brand new house. My, my parents, my dad had gotten a promotion in the military, my mom had gotten a promotion as a teacher, and we had just kind of upgraded our living. We were moving on up, and it was, it, we moved into this really nice neighborhood in uh, San Antonio, and it was really like... My parents are the type of people that like literally started, you know, live, they were living in a trailer. Dad was working at a meat packing plant. Mom was working at an ice plant, like uh, ice, like where they just like cut blocks of ice. And, uh, and, and so we had moved up in the world. And so it was this like exciting time where I was being introduced to new things because I was in a, a little more of a suburban area. And uh, just down the road was the, uh, the grocery store and they had, soda machines outside and one day while i was walking past them to head to the local comic book store they were advertised the soda machine had bubble yum soda bubble gum flavored soda and i was like all right well worst case scenario i can just like spit it out and and regret my decisions in life so i got it (laughs) i became obsessed like because one of my favorite flavors in the world was bubblegum flavored, and someone had perfectly carbonated this and turned it into a drink, which today I'm sure would cause me to throw up. But like back then, 
it was the greatest thing ever. And every time I bring it up to people, I'm like, do you guys remember that? It only lasted for like a year. And folks are like, no, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. That sounds disgusting, though. So I'm glad we didn't have it. (laughs) (laughs) Incredible. Uh, Earlier on in this uh, season of the show, I had a person describe to me like Orbit, Orbit Soda with stuff floating (laughs) in it. Uh, No! Okay, I draw the line. I draw the line. (laughs) (laughs) Whereas, like, I don't drink fizzy drinks. That's what we call them here. Uh, right. Or at least in my part of the country where I'm from, we don't. Call, I don't drink fizzy drinks. I stopped drinking fizzy drinks when I was 14 years old. Uh, I made a, a point where I was like, I'm drinking far too many of these. I drank like, I would drink like two or three cans of like cherry coke every day. Cherry coke is like my favorite thing ever, and I still like. I would still love to have like a, a t-shirt that said Coke on it or like, you know, that brand, you know, that old kind of vintage style. I love that. But mm-hmm. I had to stop drinking it because I was aware even back then that I was like, this is going to be like a serious problem. And I was a pretty, you know, chunky kid. Uh, mm-hmm. So <laughs> that's a polite way of putting it right. Uh, and so I was like, Bam, I'm cutting it out. Uh, so whenever I hear people being like, oh, there's this amazing like new monster can. I'm like awesome tell me all about it because it is forbidden fruit i want to know uh good for you i i i I envy you i only i only broke away from fizzy drinks about i guess it must have been about a year ago is when i finally stopped drinking as much and i've continuously because i have adhd and so my brain is like dopamine i just want dopamine and so it's it, it, it associates, I associate so much pleasure with, with drinking these soda drinks, of course, because they're like cocaine. So, like, my, my brain is like, oh, I want another drink. So I've actually managed to scale it back. And there was a time during the pandemic where I started feeling like crap. And I didn't realize it was because I had trimmed huge amounts of sugar out of my diet. I didn't realize that my energy and my mood and depression and everything was coming to the fore because I had changed my diet up as much as I did. The pandemic had the weird effect of, like... Most people had like a really shit time, but all mm-hmm. I did was just go for walks in, in the countryside and listen to jazz music. It was like, I'm I, okay. Uh, I, 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 I get to stay at home. I don't have yeah. to go anywhere. Okay. I, I, see, I, it's, so I'm in Los Angeles. I imagine walking to the Irish countryside listening to jazz would probably do me pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it did me quite a lot of good as well. Uh, it's amazing. I, and I, let me just say too that, um, I went, I had never been overseas or I have never left the country except for when I was a little kid. We used to go to Mexico from time to time because I lived in San Antonio and we had, um, we would take trips across the border and it was always a lot of fun. Um, But I had never been outside the country otherwise, except for the fact that I was born in Panama. That doesn't count. I was a baby. It doesn't matter. (laughs) But but my first time overseas was uh, last year when we did the D&D in a castle thing and I went to the UK for the very first time. And... I, I wish I could, <laughs> it's hard for, it felt like the Truman Show, where like you're waking up to another world that's out there, that's the kind of the real world, <laughs> and uh, moving through, I, it's difficult to explain to like my UK friends what it's like growing up in a place where the oldest thing that is nearby is like 50 years old, and yeah. <laughs> to walk down the streets of London and see buildings that predate the United States was thrilling it was amazing and and to see the english countryside and i i swear to god like when we were getting on the plane i'm like i i i know they make it hard for this very reason but i really just want to live here so bad <laughs> to get the hell out anyway sidebar what if anything is perfect mm, imperfection i think i think uh when i was uh i guess in my early 20s was when I was introduced to Buddhism. I'm a, I'm a practicing, uh, technically I'm considered a Shambhala Buddhist, but I'm very drawn to Zen Buddhism. <laughs> I'm terrible at both. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but uh, I, I'm very, very interested in Eastern thought and, and really drawn to it. And, and that all started, interestingly enough, back when I was um, a kid. And I, <laughs> my first encounter with Eastern thought was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> no joke. <laughs> it's like all my friends were focused on 
um, the badassery of these Ninja Turtles beating the living crap out of everything. And I was like, that's cool. I, I'm into that too. But what are they talking about when they're shouting about honor? <laughs> like, I didn't know what that was all about. And so that led me down like the rabbit hole of like learning more about Eastern philosophy. But mostly it, it wasn't it wasn't like, oh, I need to learn about honor. It was like, what do you mean mindfulness? What, what, like, why why is sitting in place worth anything like what like i just bunches and bunches of questions and what i found was all of this this like avalanche of literature and philosophy and fascinating contradictory thought to my western mind about living day to day and being present and there's one thing in my life that as somebody with adhd that is almost completely foreign to me which is living presently and this these these ideas of like watching your breath and being compassionate with oneself and understanding people that we're all living things the the i the concept that we are not separate these things kind of blew my brain out and i kept diving deeper and deeper and deeper into it and little bitty moments in media because that's where i really live um i would have little bitty moments in media that would kind of confirm because uh, they would kind of confirm these trains of thought because they would just be like every now and then you'd come across a writer who wrote something down that, you know, um, I'm kind of, I'm trying to not, I'm having like 30 thoughts at once. I'm trying not to derail myself, but there would be little things in movies that you'd pick up from time to time. Like there was, there was a good three years there where every movie kept using the goddamn, uh, you can't learn anything with a full cup. You have to empty your cup bullshit that like <laughs> they kept they kept i don't know why but that kept appearing in films anyway uh the point that i'm trying to get to the concept of perfection and imperfection i when i was 26 i was in the now long dead borders books and music store which is this big book chain that used to exist in the united states and there was a book in the eastern thought section i was in there reading up on tibetan buddhism and I came across this very small book called Japanese Death Poems. And all it was is a book of haiku written by um, people in Japan at the moment of their death, which during the period in which they were writing, this was tradition. They would make their final observations or reflect on their lives. Um, and they had to do it in a haiku, 575. And that just astonished me. So I wanted to see, like, I'm somebody who carries on. Like, I will, I will talk your teeth off. Like, I, I can't stop talking. So I want to see how people summarize their lives in 575. And I sat there for an entire hour, like, almost crying as I'm reading this beautiful book. And every single poem seemed to revisit the same theme over and over, that... In all imperfection, everything is absolutely perfect. Um, every every like chipped piece of stone, every every like shattered glass or uh, slurred speech or it, whatever it is that they might consider imperfect, like everything that they do, and like the dedication of being aware of it. Because when you're aware of, of the present moment and can be aware of how precious this moment is as it leaves and never returns. Um, there's just no such thing as this concept of imperfection, really. And, and I kept revisiting that. Little bitty observations that they would make as they were writing these poems down. And it just blew me away. And it made me feel so at peace and realizing that I should not be so hard on myself. And we're all in this together. Kind of, you know, all that hippie stuff. But really, honestly, like, it really occurred to me, like, reading these poems, I kind of let go of this concept of what it is to be the best or the or the perfect anything and and i've kind of clung to that ever since who is your favorite character from fiction of any kind and why Ooh. everyone always gets shocked i just ask people about like perfection and then i ask them about their favorite character and they go wow that's a tough one yeah <laughs> <We'll see>. yeah <laughs> it's for me what's tough about that is um i used to know it but it's been so long since i've dusted them off <laughs> you know and i I'm, I'm starting to think like it's so funny it's probably a very good thing that i'm so sentimental because it creates these anchor points in my memory that i can return to because for the most part getting asked these questions maybe this is perhaps being adhd it changes year to year uh it changes all the time like right now i am 
right now I'm kind of re <laughs> this has been something I've revisited time and time again, but right now I'm, I'm back into really loving Bruce Banner. Uh, that's, that's one of the characters that I really, really enjoy because the Avengers game came out. So I get to play Hulk again, which is great. Uh, that's one that I've come back to. And that has, <laughs> that has spawned an entire chain of thought of like noticing that I keep coming back to these types of fictional characters that are kind of underest. Like <laughs> when I, when I think about my, okay, this is going to be a big answer. Let me, hold on. Let me, let me scale this back a little bit. In my industry, I'm, I'm constantly surrounded by and even came up with a lot of brilliant people. Indeed, like I was there when Critical Role was launching. So I was kind of on the inside and like connected to everybody and all this other stuff. And, but like I've been close to everybody that's uh, just about everybody who's doing what I do now in a big way. Um, I was Marisha's bridesmaid. Like we were, we, like we've 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 all had like we've all been like really interconnected. And I've watched as I've discovered this medium that I have fallen in love with that has kind of rescued me from this uh, a world that didn't seem to have a place for me regarding like what I could contribute because as somebody who is constantly like grabbing at everything that's around their face, I couldn't land on any one thing. And as a result, I kind of came off like a dude who just didn't know where he was going and didn't know what he was doing. And as a result, my personality developed this, I, I, I basically developed a lot of self-esteem problems because I would watch people find something that they love or a character that they love, and that's who they are. And me, I'm grabbing at everything that's floating in front of my face. And what has culminated is me being 40 years old now and feeling like, I have no identity because I'm just grabbing at everything. I can't stake my flag in the ground and be like, this is me. Instead, I'm feeling like I, 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 keep, I keep changing directions so often that I haven't gone anywhere at the crossroads of life, so to speak. That's how it feels. What I haven't been paying attention to is the fact that because I'm grabbing at everything, I've been amassing experiences and thoughts about things that most people are missing because they're not grabbing at everything. And so it's not like it's more valuable. It's just, it's valuable, but it's not valuable in the way the world tells you it's valuable. You know what I mean? As someone with ADHD who's like grabbing at everything, I didn't stop to think maybe constantly loving every single character isn't a bad thing. Maybe picking a, maybe not being able to pick a favorite isn't a bad thing. It's true that I can't like throw my hands up and be like, oh man, DC is the best. Marvel sucks. Like, I can't be one of those people because at one moment I love the detecting work of Batman. And then the next moment I really want to see Kitty Pride beat the living crap out of the juggernaut or something. You know what I mean? So in fiction that continues to branch out and it kind of opens up this world that, that parallels my feelings about how I am being surrounded by colleagues that are constantly advancing in life. And What's developed is, is that I fall in love with characters who are underestimated or who are dismissed or not thought of as important or just the person that kind of floats under the radar. So like I'm constantly and it, and it follows through and like people that I'm attracted to, too, like everyone was like gushing about Faith because they thought she was so hot and buffy and I'm like all about Willow Rosenberg. Or like <laughs> if it's a character that's kind of like the goofy side character, I'm all about that guy because I know that there's something going on with him that nobody else sees. And I know that I'm paralleling myself to that. So while most people are picking these really fascinating, in-depth, interesting characters, I'm usually going for the one that no one's looking at because that's who I associate myself with. That's... Like, if I want to find myself in a story, I need to find the dude who doesn't appear to be contributing, but in fact is incredibly important and no one sees it. And it's kind of, it's kind of where I crawl under and like, that's the blanket that I hide under when I'm at, you know, when I'm reading my book at night kind of thing. As a result, like, I tend to find characters that have this tremendous inner strength that they find a channel for and... They kind of, and, and I think the wish fulfillment fantasy there is then it, then they kind of let it out and everyone's like, oh my God, we shouldn't have ignored him. <laughs> and I think, I think I'm drawn to those characters like Bruce Banner, who is, who's, who's like this mousy guy who has so much to offer, but no one, it's just not convenient or nobody gets him or he's just awkward. But then he also has these 
when I see the Hulk, I don't think, oh my God, he can pick up a car. It's more of like, I see a creature that's living in pure honesty in the moment with just raw emotion, total expression of who they are. Um, it, an avalanche, an elemental avalanche of exactly what's going on inside and the idea of being released like that. And, and the, the narration that comes up around Bruce about freedom of being who you are and whatnot, of course, it has a destructive side, in, but I don't really... When I look at the Hulk, I, you can definitely go that direction with stories. They certainly have. But for the most part with Hulk, I look at it from more of a classic sense of like, yes, he's cursed in all this and he has this darker side to him. But it's a character that I really appreciate because it kind of mirrors how I have felt throughout the course of my life of like, I always felt like I was somebody who just nobody understood or paid attention to or could understand or or understood how I operated but who had a lot to offer if I could just be given a chance the irony of course is is being older now discovering that I'm the one that has to give myself that chance but I still find myself drawn to those characters all the same so for the moment I would say at least for now I mean there's so many that I've fallen in love with over the years uh, one of my all favorites is uh, the main character from the book Sea Wolf by Jack London. I don't think I've read that book. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite books. It's definitely my favorite Jack London book. Um, but uh, that's one that I'm I, I, a character that I really appreciate because he starts off kind of like a nobody, <laughs> and kind of just this this dude who is just written off as somebody who's just going to be chewed alive by the ocean and and the hard life that it's going to bring, and he ends up becoming he ends up rising to the occasion and becoming somebody who can stand for themselves and survive in a harsh environment with a brutal sea captain. Um, I, I really appreciate those kinds of characters. Those are the ones I want to emulate where I'm just like, yeah, maybe that's me when I'm not so spooked by things. What fascinates you? Oh, uh, um, death. Uh, easily, uh, I would say death. Yes, death fascinates me. Death fascinates me because I don't equate death with this, uh, the, the darkness that we, especially in the West, we really incorporate this terrifying, I mean, it's, it terrifies me. But death, ultimately, one of the things that I really appreciated about being uh, introduced to Eastern thought and Buddhism is thinking death, uh, really, really seeing death as change. And that death is happening all the time. Of course, they say that. But what they're actually saying is, yeah, you know, that relationship that just fell apart, that relationship that you experienced a death, there has been a change that's gone now. Or, you know, the seasons have passed, sure. But there's also little things like this chapter of your life has come to an end, or there has been a change that has advanced, has advanced you further along in your path or whatever. Like the idea of attaching death and change and, to, and making them interchangeable. Because in a lot of Eastern thought, the word in, in their language almost means the same thing. Like, I was reading a book by a Buddhist monk named Sakyam Mimpam Rinpoche. <laughs> and... Love the pronunciation. He is... <laughs> he, he, did, he did a great book called Turning the Mind into an Ally. And I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating read. The, the, the wonderful thing about Sakyam Mimpam is, is that he, he really understands Western thought, so he's able to translate a lot of the concepts into ways that we understand. Same as Pema Chodron, who is, of course, Western to begin with. But they're able to translate these wonderful concepts and thoughts and ideas into a, a, a way of communicating to us people who have been brought up in more of a Western mindset. And it, it's, it's able to communicate to us. I get stuck on death quite often because I, especially now that I'm 40, like, it, like I knew that when I turned middle-aged that I was going to experience a moment that I saw other adults having when I was a kid, where they tell you, it's gone in a blink, like it's gone so fast. And what spooks me is, is that I don't feel like it's gone in a blink at all. I feel like the reason why it feels that way is I wasn't paying close enough attention. And the reason why it feels like it flies by is because I'm missing the moments because I'm worried about things. So when I think about death, I'm thinking about not this doom clock that's ticking over my head. I constantly think about it in terms of like really understanding, using it as my compass to understand how precious this is. And my, my mentor used to have this wonderful saying. He said, it's life. No one gets out alive. And 
keeping that close to my heart so that I don't forget. Um, and, and not to look at death as an adversary or this, this inevitable, tragic, permanent nothingness waiting for me at the end of this experience. Because <laughs> that's the way I've constantly viewed it. I've, uh, throughout the course of my life, the idea of death has terrified me into inaction just absolutely terrified me from moving at all. It, I would say that underneath my skin, it lurks as a phobia. And as a result, I've kind of gone all Batman about it and made it sort of a mantra that I, I, I pay attention to and I'm aware of. It still hurts so bad when you lose someone. And, and I, I, I do keep these thoughts in the back of my mind about the importance of life and impermanence and all these wonderful things. But I still experience the tragedy of death the same as everybody else. When I lost my friend Jimmy in 2007 to suicide, I wasn't expecting that to hit me as hard as it did. And it, it kind of set off this chain reaction. I couldn't understand why a guy as handsome and as brilliant and as talented and as envied <laughs> as him would give away such a gift. I, don't, I, I couldn't understand it. And, it. and the tragedy of it just tore me apart. But it also set off this chain reaction of like thinking about how at the end of the day, like I how absolutely rare and wonderful it all is. And I do that through the lens of death and thinking about how it, this moment's to be celebrated. It's like uh, if you've ever seen Star Trek Generations, it's one of my most favorite poignant monologues that Picard says at the very end when he's talking to Riker. And he, he's talking about Soren, the villain of the film. Because Star Trek Generations, that film is all about death. It's about change. It's about the, the handing off to the next generation. Literally, like, the, the final handing of the torch where Kirk dies and Picard moves forward and the Enterprise D is destroyed and everything is changing. And Picard has this wonderful moment where he is talking about something that Soren told him. Soren was willing to destroy an entire planet filled with people because he was trying to escape the doom of mortality, to move away from being locked into time. Essentially, he saw time as a predator that was eating him every second of his life, the same as it eats everything. And he was trying to get to the nexus where time couldn't touch him anymore. And Picard has the monologue and says that someone once told him that time was a predator that stalks us all of our lives, but he would rather think of time as a companion who goes along with us on the journey and reminds us to value each moment because it'll never come again. That's my way out of being terrified by the idea of dying and losing. And so as somebody who can get easily wrapped up in my fears, I, I spend a lot of time trying to remind myself about death. It's something that fascinates me and that I try to keep I try to keep it in the corner of my eye and I try not to see the grim visage of the reaper waiting for me <laughs> and a cold grave in the ground but rather um, I, I try to keep in mind those brilliantly cleverly written words by the writer of Star Trek Generations that um, that without this experience that's inevitable in my life that the values of everything that I'm experiencing would, what a waste of time. <laughs> if it was permanent, what a waste of time. Um, and instead, instead just, just remember that, um, that it's, it's my responsibility not to miss this. What is the most valuable thing you've ever learned? Hmm. I think the most valuable thing that I have ever learned in my life is that uh, I, have, I have nothing to reveal to myself. Um, it, the, the unfortunate thing is, is that this is knowledge that I've acquired, but not knowledge that I've put into practice. And that, of course, is welcome to the human condition. Um, and of course, what I mean by that I have nothing to reveal to myself is, is that there's nothing that my thoughts can reveal about myself. Uh, the idea of like running in a circle, like in a hamster cage, trying to intellectualize my way through my life's problems, <laughs> as if that's something you could actually do. So many of us kind of trick ourselves into believing that we can browbeat ourselves into a state of mind or a state of being. And uh, I, I think the most valuable thing I've learned is 
I, I sure they can make you feel good, but every time I see somebody post a positive affirmation to the entire world that they're awesome and that they're going to make it, there's a part of me that appreciates how positive this person is trying to be, and another side of me that just wants to smash my computer screen. <laughs> Alan Watts <laughs> once said, "Can you imagine a world filled?" with um with holy people can you imagine how awful that would be <laughs> he said he would he would he would lock himself up in his cabin with a gun and never come out <laughs> uh he uh the, the the i think the most valuable thing that i have learned is is that um you don't need to browbeat yourself into a positive state of mind in fact in truth the best way to exist is to value all of your experiences and there have been so many instances where I've tried, as I said before, intellectualizing my way through a problem, trying to think my way out of depression or trying to like think my way through my anxiety. And of course, really what I'm doing is, is I'm, ta I'm tossing it tidbits. Like I I'm really just like, right, this is an excellent, ex like I can battle this, like I can handle this. Or I would just try to think positive or I would see somebody telling me that I'm awesome and I would be like, hey, you know, they're right. Instead of realizing that all, all this is all designed to do is to keep me in this whirlwind of, I need somebody to tell me everything's going to be okay, you know? And, and, and that's a wonderful sentiment. It's certainly, it's certainly incredibly important to have support. My God, it's so important to have support and to have an outlet and whatnot. But at the end of the day, no matter what happens, no matter how many ways you cut this at the end of the day it's you and you and you got to square with that and there have been so many times where i have looked outside myself for answers and when i thought i was working my way through things what i was really doing is trying to intellectualize my way through things or try to you know again browbeat myself into a state of being like a, a like a positive thinker or somebody, nope, I'm not going to be anxious today. I'm not going to be anxious today. Or like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, would, I, would con I would constantly do that. <laughs> and again, I, I reference Alan Watts a lot when I talk about this because he had such disdain for like the new age movement. And, and he had such disdain for like all of, because he, he was like, he, he came up in a very different era. And it, it, I'll never forget the lecture in which he confessed that it blew his mind that yoga was now a class you could get credit for. <laughs> and like, he wasn't complaining. He's just like, this was unthinkable five years ago. And now it's something that you can do at UCLA. Um, but he disdained it so much because his whole thought process was is that by trying to calm yourself down or trying to be this positive person or this, this, beacon or like trying to force yourself or become or trying to become this thing that is like a peaceful person you're getting in your own way and it shows that you don't understand that you were this person to begin with and you're not trying to wake up to it you're trying to force yourself into become it so you're building this facsimile of this 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 sort this facade rather of yourself instead of just being you and one of the best ways to do that, of course, is to actually accept the experiences as you have them and value the shit as much as you value the gold. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so one of the most valuable things I have learned, because when I came out to L.A. and my anxiety was like, oh, man, you're not being medicated anymore. I'm going to have so much fun with you. Like when I moved out to Los Angeles in this city of like. Jerry Seinfeld called Los Angeles the only city where it's, it's different from Las Vegas because the difference between Los Angeles and Las Vegas is if you b go bust in Las Vegas, you leave Las Vegas. <laughs> um, the more I hear about LA, the more I'm like, this is the worst, best place in the world. This is the worst, it, exactly. best place ever. It, it, everyone hates each other. It, it is. And everyone loves each other. And I don't, I would be eaten alive. And I'm so glad I was it's, not there. <laughs> it, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. It, it is a place of like where commerce and art clash in an epic battle. And they constantly, and, and, and it gets mutated too, where commerce becomes art and art becomes commerce. And, and you know, there are, the, <laughs> there are people like me who are, you know, you're never going to see on the big screen or anything, but we're still out here still trying to like chip away at it.
And one of the things that got me through that was the lesson that um, if, I'm going to, if I'm going to be, if I'm really going to wake up to the authentic self, as they say, I need to let go of the idea that I need to go find myself or that I need to, <laughs> that I need to sit down and really think hard about who I am. Like, and talk about ridiculous things like, what color defines me? <laughs> or like, what's my style? Um, and instead of, of thinking about these things, find them or let them find me. And, and wake up to the fact that um, the harder that you try to wake up, the, the harder you're squeezing your eyes closed. And, and in truth, like, you're working against it. And, and uh, so that was probably the most valuable that's been the most valuable lesson that I've learned, which has been wonderful because it's made everything that I do. Now, all of a sudden, not being this ideal positivity guru that I see a lot of people trying to become, now all of a sudden, it's perfectly okay to be human. My God, that's what you're supposed to be. <laughs> so, like... On, on, on my Twitter, I post, like, poetry and art and, like, just be nice. You know, I don't... I'm not yeah. like you're I, I say don't be hard on yourself that's it like I'm not like you know you can wake up tomorrow and you're gonna grind and you no fuck that <laughs> you're not gonna grind because you're you um if what you want to do is suffer your way to success be my guest because what's gonna happen to you is at some stage you're gonna realize how much you've suffered and how much you didn't want to suffer and what you could have been doing in the time that you were suffering and then you're gonna be fucking <laughs> miserable uh, so you <laughs> yeah. can you can do all of that or you can kind of stumble your way like because you can just admit actually rather that you're just stumbling your way through everything and at some stage you'll you'll find a little torch on the ground you'll pick it up and be like wow this is amazing and mm -hmm. that's class I, I think one of the great tools to life that uh that, that this totally links up with the lesson that i've learned is, is the way to really sort of find your way through that is something that dan millman liked to say a lot in his book way of the peaceful warrior which was um, find the humor. Like that's just such an incredible tool. Don't try to make it funny because that's you trying to force a state of being again, but try to find the humor in something. And it's an incredible tool to like letting go and laughing about the red light you just hit when you're late. It's, it's a tremendous act of compassion towards oneself if you can find the humor in something, especially when you've been less than perfect, mm. <laughs> which of course leads us back into the idea of like, wait a minute, what does that mean exactly perfect? <laughs> if you could name a hot sauce, what would you call it and why? I would name it something so ridiculously absurd, like, like nuclear atomic core ice cream. It needs to be like, please, like, I... Coming from South Texas and actually working in Southern California, I've seen a lot of ridiculously named hot sauces because there's a lot of like indie hot sauce makers that want to like really break the mold. And the most ridiculous one I saw was the devil's asshole. That was, I was like, that was just staring everybody in the face. I can't believe this is the first time I've seen this one. <laughs> it would be absurd. It, it would fill up the entire label. It would be like nuclear molten core ice cream <laughs> so i would I, I one of the one of the things that i love to do is like and, and this is not because i think i'm being clever but i like surprising myself sometimes and even if it takes it even if it deflates what i was trying to say I, I don't know why i have the impulse to do this it makes writing quite exciting but like it's not uncommon for me to throw something absurd out there and immediately cold water the hell out of it like a second later <laughs> and and so so like you see me going somewhere, but then, and then it's like it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, and, and so like, I, would, I would absolutely want to fucking do that on a, on a label. <laughs> and just be like, ice cream at the end. <laughs> and just be like, what the Extreme hell? hug. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. What is your most prized physical possession? I would say... <laughs> I would say it's a pencil. Okay. There is, there is this wooden pencil. So the same year that... I was, I'll never forget, I was opening presents. It was Christmas Day. We, my family was weird. We opened presents on Christmas Eve. That was the big, we still do that. We're, we're one of those families that do it on Christmas Eve. And, and, and then Christmas morning was when we opened presents from Santa. Christmas Eve, we're throwing open presents. And it's been a good year for me. I just got a Super Nintendo. Like, this is the best damn, not just a Super Nintendo. My mom went nuts. She got me a Super Nintendo and she got me a Game Boy. So I have never been spoiled like this in my life. I, there's no reason in the world I had to hope 
for both an SNES and a Game Boy. So I'm like cloud nine. I'm like, I'm never going to bed tonight. <laughs> I'm going to go play Pilot Wings until my eyes bleed. And so I'm, I'm excited. Like, I'm almost dizzy from the excitement. Because it took forever to convince my parents to get me a Nintendo. They refused and refused. And when they finally got it, and I went on all those incredible adventures, it was the best thing in my life. <laughs> and getting an SNES was life-changing. It was like I was on cloud nine. I thought nothing can get any better. And I got handed my last present, and it was a small little box, and I opened it up. Um, now, I mentioned that my mom was a teacher. And my mom, she, <clears throat> she started off as a, a math teacher and like an, a, like an assistant teacher because you always do assistant work before you become a full-fledged teacher. And she became a teacher. Then she became the head of the math department. Then she ended up going back to school at my age now, like 40, I believe it was. And she got her degree, a master's degree, because she wanted to go into administration. So she came back from that and then became an assistant principal. Then she became vice principal. And then they made her the principal of the largest middle school in San Antonio, Texas, which is amazing. And they were inviting her. Like, she kept being asked to join higher and higher ranks, and she retired instead. <laughs> she just loved teaching, and she kind of missed it. So um, anyway, the point is, is that as somebody who was teaching, she had access to our woodshop class. And apparently, for a month leading up to the holiday break, after school, when she was done grading, she would go down to the woodshop class in her mid-90s, like, shoulder pad dress that she wore to school every day. And she would put on goggles and work with the woodshop teacher. And she made me a pencil set with a, uh, with a pen. And it's, it's made out of wood. It's polished. It's, it, if you saw it on, the, on, like, if you saw it on a shop for sale, it'd be, like, 12 bucks. And she handed me this, and I was kind of just stunned looking at it. Because I, I pictured my mom wearing these terrible plastic glasses and the apron in her dress with her jewelry on, which you're not supposed to wear in woodshop, and making, like, making me a pencil That's out of wood. so sweet. And I have, I, I, I've tried to communicate to her to this day that I, I, I still have it, and it's, it's probably one of the most precious things anyone's ever given me. It, it means the world to me. Like, I get emotional talking about it because I can't believe my mom did that, of all the things. And so I, I'll never forget. I didn't even realize I was doing it, but when I was playing my Super Nintendo up to, like, four in the morning and getting in trouble, the whole time I had the pencil sitting next to me. And ever since then, I've, I've carried it with me. Like, every time I move a house, I make sure I know exactly where it is. I know what box it's stored in. Like, it's become something of, a, again, like a talisman. So I just I really keep it close because uh, she she put she she put a concerted effort to craft something for me. I can't let that go. That's so sweet. That's like so so sweet. <laughs> you have no idea. That's that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, she's a she's a good one. I can't. I have to, <laughs> I have to stop. That's so nice. That's so <laughs> like that's such a thoughtful thing to do. That's like it really is. My brother just kind of tossed his aside. He got one too, and he was like, "Thanks, mom." <laughs> And he went back to life. <laughs> he didn't care. <laughs> but like I and my mom, and, and I'll never forget the way my brother reacted to it. And the way my mom, my mom is such a practical woman. She is so ridiculously like, I don't know how to describe her. Uh, the women on my mom's side of the family, they're, they're like, they're, they're difficult to describe. They're carved from like steel. They have just such a, because my, my folks are all Southern and they have just this way of looking at things that's unlike anything I've ever encountered anywhere else. And the way, they, the way they approach death and the way they approach like everyday living and problems that get handed to them. And this sort of like <laughs> blase style of just like dealing with shit. Like, oh yeah, we'll, just, we'll get it done. That's fine. Like, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Hey baby, what are you doing? Not much, mom. Um, just doing some writing work. What's up? Um, not much. Just want to let you know, um, your, your dad had uh, a tumor removed today, but it's no big deal. So anyway, <laughs> I'm like, my dad had what? Wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like, could you please back that up about a year? 
And why am I just now hearing about this? And her response is always just like, well, it wasn't a big deal. We didn't want you to worry. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it is a big deal. I should worry about it. I know. Right. My grandmother, my grandmother, God rest her, like she's, she was just like, um, the, <sighs> The doctor, this, this is a perfect example of the women on my mom's side of the family. The doctor comes in and tells her, Doris, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's my, that's my grandmother my, on my, uh, Donna. Um, so it is cancerous, but it looks good. So treatments are going to be very effective. There's a couple of options here. And my grandmother, Donna, just goes, oh, it's breast cancer. Just cut them off. I don't use them anymore. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I was like, fucking excuse me? That was her attitude. She's like, I'm, I'm in my 70s. Why? I don't even need them. Like, get rid of it. It's fine. <laughs> if, it's the most, if it's the best way to do this, just get rid of it. Like, <laughs> okay. So they did. And she probably didn't care. <laughs> they were like, no, she was like, eh. And when they told her, like, listen... The, the bleeding is internal, but I can tell you now that if we go in and fix it, we're just going to be back here again in six months. So our options are, are very limited. And my grandmother was like, it's time for me to meet Jesus. It's fine. Yeah. That's literally how they approach it. And as somebody who is not Christian, like hearing this, I'm, I'm still very impressed. But that was the practical way in which my grandmother said, yeah, you know, I think it's my time. It's fine. So th she refused treatment. She's like, no, nah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it. This has been yeah. good. <laughs> it's kind of like, and I'm just like, I, it's so, like, here's somebody, as, as, as somebody who is in their early 30s, like, freaking out still about the concept of death. And then my grandmother is just like, oh, yeah, we had an appointment. Um, yeah, we can do it now. <laughs> it's kind of her approach. And, that's, and, and it shows up in my mom all the time. And so when she sees somebody clutch to something, and she sees somebody toss it aside. She has the same sort of stoic reaction to it. Like, oh, good. I'm glad you like it. Oh, you don't like it? Okay. But then when I tell her, when I tell her later, I'm like, just so you know, I still have that pencil. So you can hear it in her voice because her answers become incredibly short suddenly. <laughs> and she'll just say, oh, good. Mm. But you can hear it. Like, oh, no. She's about to cry. <laughs> <laughs> what inspires you? Um, that would be Sam DeLev. And, and this might... This, Sam inspires me because what I see in them is somebody who functions cognitively on a level that is significantly higher than most human beings. Um, they have an articulation, an insight, and an intellect that I, I'm just... When I describe Sam, I'm like, they sh they're Mensa-level genius. And they're applying that intelligence, that incredible intelligence, to all of these delightful, whimsical things. Which, to me, demonstrates that underneath all of that powerful thinking is this great wisdom that just kind of exists naturally. And it seems to be intrinsic in people who are similar to Sam, who just function on a different level. The reason why I find Sam so inspiring is because Sam, has, Sam is made of iron. And I don't mean that in the sense that they've had shit thrown at them in their life and they deal with chronic pain or all that inspiration porn bullshit. What I'm talking about is like Sam has the ability in a world that never stops beating on them. And I'm talking about like society as a whole and in, in a world that is constantly, subtly, every day just accepted that Sam is not as valuable as abled people or uh, non-binary is not a gender or you know what I mean? Like all these things that very subtly every day they wake up to. Sam has found it in themselves to be a teacher, which to me demonstrates a level of compassion and patience on, on an extraordinary, like it's precious. I could not have evolved into the person I am in understanding trans issues, disability. Um, I was one man, if you had known me in, in the early 2000s, I absolutely was that asshole that was commenting like I was a feminist and then saying shit like she shouldn't be wearing that much makeup. <laughs> like I was that asshole, 100%. And I, I honestly had this concept of what it was to be a good person because I was, I was completely blind to the cancer that is privilege. Completely blind to the toxic effect of masculinity and the way 
it had eroded me all my life. The one thing that I had going for me is there a genuine desire to get past my own bullshit and actually listen. And when I connected with Sam, I finally found somebody I trusted, I listened to, who, by example, um, I was able, and not because I asked Sam or anything like that, Sam, very patiently, by example, reminded me of the human experience as a whole. And I was able to, through that companionship, was able to finally kind of break through that disgusting, toxic muck that society had built around a cis white privileged kid, mm. you know? And this is not something I went asking Sam to do. This is just the byproduct of diversity and being included and, and being around diversity. Do you know mm. what I mean? To opening yourself up to that human experience and to hearing everybody's story and to do less talking and more listening. Um, that was my personal experience that kind of set me on the path of waking the fuck up. And the reason why I find Sam so inspirational is because of that. It's not a task that Sam signed up for. Sam does not consider it their job to teach you. And Sam doesn't want people coming to them saying, oh, please tell me how to do this. <laughs> or how do I be a, not a shitty person? That's not it at all. But Sam, through the virtue of seeing what was important and through love very patiently like enduring all of the she her oh i mean they them do you know what i mean day in day out sam is a prime example of somebody who takes what life throws at them in regards to the people that they love and in their close circles and finds the humor in it which denotes this incredible amount of wisdom and compassion so for example one of my favorite things to point at is to why i love sam so dearly is they made a comment on, um, on National Coming Out Day. <laughs> and they posted on their Twitter, this was years ago, but they said, hi, my name's Sam, I'm non-binary, uh, my pronouns are she, her, oh wait, shit, sorry, they, them, as a way of kind of poking fun at what everyone calls them. And they do this all the time with regards to people like, I'm gonna take a stand for something. Sam will be like, well, that leaves me out. <laughs> <laughs> like, Sam, the reason why I find them so ins inspiring is because the strength isn't the fact that they're a former Paralympic athlete or that they're built like a shit brick house, like they could bench press twice their body weight. It's not like, it's not the fact that they, it's not just the fact that they endure day in and day out chronic pain or the bullshit that the world throws at them. Sometimes even people who are close to them making slip ups and all of that. The, the, the part that just, that just, leaves me awestruck is that Sam is still able to find the humor in it through everything, everything I've just told you, like Sam still is capable of finding the humor in it. And like, there is a part of me that's, that is intimately aware of how precious and beautiful that is and how that, that is somebody who, even if you're in their orbit, you're going to become a better person. Even if you don't have, direct con and it's not because it's their responsibility it's certainly not something they should ever feel responsible for but the same way that people are sort of drawn to those who have a magnetic personality or or have like a message that speaks to you sam's very presence um makes it okay to be human and reminds us that you can find the humor in things and, and I, I find that to be so rare and, and wonderful and an incredible, just, and so powerful. Just, mm. they would never, they would never, they would never ever describe themselves as invincible. They would laugh and, and <laughs> they would laugh and they would rub their head with their hand <laughs> and they would look down at the floor and they would get shy. But I'm telling you, like Sam is made of steel. It's not because of what they endure. It's because they take what's getting thrown at them and they still find a way to love everything. And I, I am, day in and day out, I'm constantly just mind blown by it. Being with the way I, the way I sound, we had a discussion on this on, on this show, um, which I lost because my 
all of my audio disappeared, so I couldn't actually include it. Uh, <laughs> but we had a discussion on the show where we talked about the fact that it's so frustrating to sound the way that we both sound and then have people automatically assume. Like, because there is an assumption, literally nobody is perfect. Literally nobody in the entire right. world. Even like, I'm, I exist in a lot of trans spaces. And people mm-hmm. fuck up all the time, especially if you don't like actively right. see someone in person. Like you can right, right. slip up on pronouns. You can like, but the thing that bothers me and that irks a lot of trans people is the oh god, I'm so mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. No, no, just just fix it. Like I don't care. Nobody cares. You're human. That's it. Yeah. Just fix it. Just go. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Th- this like, but the oh god, you're made of paper. Oh, I have to, I have to fix it. <laughs> no, no, like no one cares. Like, um, and Sam, Sam, they are just so wonderful. Like, and, and that was one of Sam's points was like, the fact that people think we're made of paper is ridiculous. It's ridiculous, but they're incredible. Yeah, it's super, yeah. I mean, simplicity. so in, in Sam plays, full disclosure on that too, and I don't know, <laughs> I suspect Sam won't care, but I, I should say that Sam is actually my partner. and. Um, and us dating and us falling in love has been an incredible shifting point in, uh, my life because it's waking up to the fact of like Sam pointing out, (laughs) Sam started jokingly calling me their little queer boy. (laughs) And I was like, really? I, uh, why would you say that? And they're like, well, you're not dating a woman anymore. And I was like, oh my God, you're right. I didn't even think of mm-hmm. this. And Sam is like, you know, you should consider because Sam was like, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about the type of people you're attracted to. And it's true. I have been kind of attracted to um, femme presenting people who are either more mask or like in the, in the old days, I just called them tomboys, of course. Um, it, back in the back in the un the the dark ages, I suppose I don't know, <laughs> but um like um but like <laughs> Sam can point at somebody in a room and be like you know if it's if it's uh like if it's a girl with short hair, Sam can point at that person and be like oh yeah Eric's into that one, <laughs> and so we we would have we would have conversations about this and and the, the reason why I'm saying all this is like. Dating Sam has been uh, has been eye opening in this in the fact that it has become a journey for me too. Waking up to the fact that now all of a sudden I'm bisexual apparently because I date more than women, <laughs> and so like waking up to that and having long conversations about that and being involved in that has been kind of mind blowing, and it's been it's been a very interesting journey. Like I, I never I'll never ever use. Like I, I put it in my Twitch chat because I want people to know that if they're a member of the community, it's a safe place to come and, and hang out. But I've never, I've never waved the pride flag because I always feel like eh, I don't. Sam gets irritated with me when I bring this up, but um, I never, I feel like it's not my right to inherit that. Like, nah, and Sam's like, yes, and I'm like, no. Nah. Mm. I mean, I'm. I don't feel like I've I'm heard. on Team Sam here. It totally is. Uh, there's. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Sam's like, <laughs> Sam's like, guess what, sweetie? No, you get to wave it. And I was like, I, I know. I just feel. It's just I. I went through my entire life being, you know, a bearded white dude, a bearded cis white dude who dated women. It just feels like I'm trying to get in on your action. If I'm like, yep, I'm LGBTQ plus now, and I'm just, I don't know. I just, I was like, it doesn't feel right somehow. <laughs> like. Anyway, uh, but Sam, Sam's patiently just waiting for me to shut the fuck up about it. <laughs> um, I, if you don't mind me saying, I had my suspicions when you bought them Avengers on Twitter because I saw that and I was like, <laughs> mm, something's either this dude is yeah. the best friend that you could ever ask for or there's something going on. <laughs> uh, hey, it's. Yeah, I mean, also, I galvanized the community into buying Sam a Nintendo Switch so they could play Animal Crossing during the pandemic. And, and uh, like, it's funny, because I, I know the community knows at this point, even though it hasn't been, like, blatantly stated. I mean, I've told people, like, that my partner is not a woman and, uh, and that I, I, you know, identify as bi now, and, and, and they've been really happy for me. No one says anything, but I'm 99.9% sure everybody knows. It's like the, the, you're leaving everyone be the detective. I respect that. 
Yeah, because it's not something, because here's, here's the other thing too, it's a strange reality when you are visible on the internet. Um, I had, I was, I'm incredibly, incredibly lucky in that I've had wonderful partners in the past. Like, um, I dated a, a wonderful woman named Rachel Seely, who I absolutely am going to recommend you interview because she is just one of the most amazing people I've met in my life. She is so funny and brilliant and talented. And um, I love her dearly. She's just a wonderful person. And we were kind of open about it on the internet. I didn't want to, I didn't want to um, hide the fact. And there's also, when you fall in love with somebody, there's also this impulse to shout it from the rooftops like an idiot. And <laughs> um, the strange reality of being visible in the internet space is that if things don't go well or they don't work out or life changes or something happens and a breakup happens, that now too is part of the discourse. And that never occurred to me, but when Rachel and I had started dating, um, all of a sudden, like, we, we, weren't, we didn't have the ending that Matt and Marisha had, where they got married and lived happily ever after kind of thing, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it was, it's more complicated, like human relationships are. And so it gets nerve-wracking, the idea of, like, yes, I'm going to go bragging to everybody that I'm the fool that's lucky enough to get to date Sam DeLev. And for some reason, I was lucky enough to be able to date Rachel Seeley. But, um, but it gets, it gets nerve wracking when, how open you are about it in the space. And so Sam and I kind of decided early on, we weren't going to just advertise it. We weren't going to necessarily hide it, but we weren't going to advertise it either. Yeah, it's not going to be because we on like a Twitter bio thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it's something people can figure out mm. and I'm not going to hold back my esteem when I'm talking about Sam, but, um, but it's, it's one of those things where it's just like... Sam is also the first best friend I've ever dated. Like, I've never had a situation where I was friends with somebody for almost half a decade and then we fell in love. Like, that's never happened before. So this is like a deeply intimate relationship. And, uh, and it's, it's <laughs> happening during a very unusual time because <laughs> we didn't really start dating till just a few months before COVID smashed us in the face. Mm. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been really interesting. If you could say all of your work had a theme, what would that theme be? We constantly, we constantly talk about how the games that we play and the stories that we tell are called hope punk and the idea that it's kind of in defiance of, in defiance of sort of the darkness that's out there, we still l put hope to as, as a central theme of the stories that we tell. And what's fascinating to me about that is that in Buddhism, often... And this once appeared in an episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, which I was like, oh my god, I can't believe they're talking about this. There, there was a moment in Avatar The Last Airbender where Avatar Aang, Aang says something about how the monks told him he shouldn't hope. And the reason why is because it pulls you away from what's happening in front of your face. But he didn't go into detail. He just kind of let it, let it sit there. And Katara had this really kind of sad reaction, like, that sounds awful <laughs> kind of reaction. And you see this theme get revisited in major films, too. Like, one of my favorites is Shawshank Redemption, where Red tells Andy, like, hope is dangerous. Don't do it. It'll break you. Like, and Andy's, Andy's contradicting that by saying, no, hope is probably the best of things. Now we as an RPG group are diving into hope punk, this idea of like injecting positivity and hope into the stories that we're telling in a world that seems to be going mad around us. And there's always a part of me that is like still on the fence about what it means and what hope really is. Um, is it pulling you away, your attention away from what's happening in front of you? Because is hope wishing or, or, or longing for something to be different or believing that it can change? And is that a driving force that actually makes change happen? Is, it, is, it, is, it, is hope something that you do passively that kind of puts you into complacency? Or is that the thing that pushes you forward to actually get the thing done? Because those who are crazy enough to charge the line in like World War I, were they hoping? Or were, were things that have been accomplished, great things of significance? Were they hoping or was hope something that they gave to people that were looking for someone to lead? Do you know what I mean? Is that, is that something a leader or somebody who is taking action gives to people who want to see change? Or is hope what that leader has that makes the change? 
And I've always been on the fence about that. Um, I don't see hope as a bad thing, but I've always been kind of curious because um, hope has certainly kept people's head above water. But how lovely would it be if you could focus on swimming? Um, and so I've always been kind of stuck on that. And what I've come to realize is we call what we do hope punk, and we, we, we definitely talk about the positivity of hope. But hope is the fuel you put in the tank if you are, if you are driven to do something. And it's what keeps a team moving, I think, and what keeps people focused. But I think in the end, um, if I were to pick a theme about what we do, I don't necessarily know that I would call it hope. I, I would call it more like if there was, if there was a theme into the work that I do, it would be, um, <laughs> I'm trying to avoid saying this because it's so cliche. <laughs> it's, it, it, at the end of the day, no matter how you, you can phrase it any way you want and get as poetic as you want about it. And you can certainly use language to help people arrive to where you are without writing it off by using the, the boilerplate explanation. But at the end of the day, it's always love. There's, there's, you, can, you, can, you can get as flowery as you want with it. But the stories that we tell are different and, and the things that we do, and, and, because my work is essentially stream punks now. It's what we do. And the stories that we tell, they're different from like Dungeons and Dragons games, which certainly carry those themes. Like you can find that in uh, like Pirates of Salt Bay, Rivals of Waterdeep, Critical Role. Like you can find these wonderful stories that can uplift especially when you see like the friendships unfolding in front of you and the love that the people at the table have for each other. Um, the stories that we tell are not being delivered in, a, in an environment where it's like, and I just said this recently on a stream, but Dungeons and Dragons is very much like a sporting event. When you throw dice, you really don't know what the fuck's going to happen. <laughs> and the game, will, the game will dictate what goes down at that point. And in many ways, it's a tremendous, exciting, thrilling strength because it's like life. You make the attempt. You roll the dice. You don't know what's going to happen. And it's exciting as hell to watch that. It adds an element to narrative that is impossible to look away from. It's one of the reasons why D&D 5e is such a compelling system when delivering story on, online. And it's one of the reasons why so many people are attracted to game systems that have that pass or fail, oh my god, we're going to go for it. Here's what's, on, here's what's at stake. It, it's, it's like a sporting event. The stories that we run are so much more angled towards narrative contribution. Because in our games, dice rolls can be manipulated to achieve success through like an economy of momentum or, or threat or story points or experience points or whatever. You can, uh, in Vampire, you can use willpower points to sort of angle yourself towards success. But in the games that we run traditionally, there have been a lot of tools that the players have been given to seize their moments. It's another reason why I love players who love failure, <laughs> because they'll be like, you know, I could spin my way out of this, but I want to see what my character does when they fail horribly. <laughs> Sam completely changed my perspective on failure. Because Sam lives for story. They live for story. They want to see what happens next. That's so much more important than them. And this is, this is something I tease them about all the time, because Sam is brilliant at breaking game systems. All they do is they find how to break a game system by optimizing the... Sh They're not a power gamer. <laughs> They're literally like, hey, this is just math. Like, I'm breaking this shit down. If I want to optimize the fuck out of a rogue and kill a dragon in one strike, I'm going to do it. So, like, you're not going to, you know... But Sam is also somebody who's like, oh, hell yes, I just rolled a natural one. They shifted my complete perspective because, I like, it wasn't that I was afraid of failure before, but... They made me excited to fail. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'm like now I'm I'm going to be DMing my own D and D game, not for the first time, but like a new campaign after a long hiatus of playing D and D. And I'm like, I want my players to fuck up so badly so that I may. Yeah. I I want the challenge. I want the story that I was going to tell to be completely wrong, and I want my big bad villain to roll in that one on. Oh D &D. yes. Yeah. It's so many people don't realize it's such a gift. It's like when I would do, when I was still doing stage acting, there'd be a moment where someone forgot their lines. And that, that goes two different ways. It could be a moment of utter terror. 
or it can be a gift. It could be just gold that you did not expect you were going to get because an authentic moment is about to happen. You, you, you have, you can't, no matter what happens, Polonius has to get stabbed <laughs> and then like that has to happen. You've committed to this. Okay. You've got to get there. And if, um, if a line gets forgotten, you've still got to, it still has to happen. So an organic, unpredictable moment that you, you should never label, just like, just commit to it. And failure gives us these wonderful moments. Of course, there's going to be moments of frustration when you've rolled to like your third natural one in a row at a critical moment and you just want to smash a glass bottle over your face and throw yourself through a window. Like, I get it. <laughs> but, um, but with our games and the themes that we have in our games, there's so much more narrative control on part of the players. And this is... This has put us in a unique position because it means we've ended up crafting a theme for ourselves, but it also puts a tremendous amount of responsibility on the role of the players that you don't normally see in other RPGs. Like in Critical Role, it's a bunch of brilliant actors and, and voiceover actors interacting with each other and in the background sort of filling in all of the colors that Matt's painting with his narrative. In our games, it's not, they're not as much in the background with the narrative because they have to take more agency in how results are formulated by way of rolling dice and spending momentum and basically taking control of some of the narrative from me. It's very rare in our games where they fail doing anything. And at first, I hated that. I hated it. Because <laughs> it felt like I wasn't properly challenging my players. But what ended up coming out of this is we ended up getting stories where success and failure was not what was important at all, where we ended up crafting a theme for ourselves that ended up becoming our brand, which is all this was about was sticking together, supporting one another, and getting through really tough times together. And for some, they were like, yeah, I'm going to go watch D&D. That's legit. They're like, no, nah, I'm going to my, I'm go watch my football game, my football nerd game. That's totally legit. And I, I, I don't blame them because it's exciting and thrilling. And I love watching D&D games. They're, they're always fun, especially when they can deliver great narrative like Critical Role or Rivals of Waterdeep. But, um, but there were a lot of really loyal audience members that stuck with us because they were like, I, I love the story that's getting told here. I love the contributions that all the players are making to the narrative and adding more blocks and yes, ending everything else. It's not about success or failure. It's how they succeed and how they fail that makes our games unique. And that's where we got Hope Punk from, essentially. <laughs> Bringing it all the way back around, I would say um, what we bring to the table and, and the work that we create with each other that has become my work, my, my sort of life's work at the moment, is, um, is that we are, we are constantly crafting stories where uh, the theme is essentially the human condition and supporting ourselves as we move through our lives. Again, I would just point at fellowship. What makes you smile? Hmm, I love zany madcap humor. <laughs> I love humor that smashes and makes no sense. I, I, Monty Python crafted who I am. Yes. Um, yes. I moved to Los Angeles because I wanted to be a sketch comic after falling in love with Monty Python. It was Monty Python, Kids in the Hall, and even Mr. Show with Bob and David, which, did, which was much, much later. But um, I loved bizarre, zany, madcap humor that made no sense, that was like obviously highly educated and self-aware, but made no fucking sense. Like it was just completely absurd. Like a penguin exploding on top of a television set was brilliant to me. <laughs> like I just, I loved, I acknowledge Monty Python is extremely problematic as a historical document. <laughs> For a lot of reasons, but it's great. I love it. it. It it still stands the test of time as one of my favorite pieces of comedy. Like I still throw on Monty Python, and I'm like, I could think about all the implications that the individual performers inside there. Like some of them are really bad now. Some of them didn't change with the time. Some of them did, but some of them didn't. But I'm still allowed to take this and look at all the people that it inspired, and look at how it inspired me, and go, wow, I love this. Uh, yeah, same here. Same here. Like. I, I, I am sad every time I'm sad every time John Cleese opens his mouth. <laughs> I'm sad. I'm sad every time. I mean, 
uh, what's his name? The American, uh, Terry. Every time he opens his mouth, I'm like, shut the f- You're the worst. <laughs> of course you're the worst. Of course like, you have to be, yeah. <laughs> um, um, but like every time you, every time Eric Idle says something, I, I'm like, yes, thank you. Oh my God, I was right loving you. Yeah. Or, or like every time you see the incredibly rare appearance of Michael Palin, like I get really excited about, because that's a man who just fell in love with the world. And when I think of like who, who I idolize in Monty Python, it's always Michael Palin. Um, it's, uh, that, that style of humor really sculpted me as a kid and really got me <laughs> realizing that like, I wonder what would happen if I stopped trying to be funny and just started doing what, in, what, Monty, what the Monty boys did, which is just do things that made them laugh. And, um, and that is where I found a large part of who I am. And, and the confidence to actually, because I, uh, you know, like most kids, I, especially somebody who had ADHD, I was in special education growing up. Um, I was diagnosed with learning disabilities. They kind of separated me from a lot of the kids in school. Um, they just assumed that I had a learning disability. So they were just like, they put me in what's called level five observation. So that means that like there's a teacher that's always there looking over your shoulder, trying to keep you on task and to get you to learn. And uh, they put me on Ritalin. And uh, it was just like all throughout my, my educational career, I was in spec ed. And that was that. I was just, I was brought up in the public school system to think that there was something wrong or something. And then um, when I discovered things like Monty Python, it helped me break away from this concept of who I was because I stopped, I stopped thinking as much and just started blurting things out and being as random as possible because they were doing it. And what I discovered was, is I could be funny. I, I could have moments where I was funny. And uh, Monty Python just helped me. It really delivered that for me. Like, I was that dumbass at the gaming table, like so many others, who was throwing out, uh, you know, holy grail quotes. But I was also, like, throwing out uh, the original show quotes and stuff like that. Like, I, just, I studied everything that they were doing. I was so enraptured and if they made a joke about like cardinal richelieu i would be like i gotta look this guy up who the fuck is cardinal richelieu like i i it was it was it was amazing it had a huge impact on me so things that make me laugh are things that are just completely wild like instantaneous suddenly i i hate admitting this but for a while i really loved family guy because of how fucking random it was um i then here's the thing about old comedy right but i think (laughs) people have a very specific view of like the shit that is problematic like south park for example a very problematic show the thing is i try and view things i i do my best i mean sometimes it's impossible and thankfully i don't have to deal with this about harry potter because i never liked harry potter so it's great um but like when it comes to old stuff i have the perspective that that old stuff influenced so much of what i like now that it can't it, it still holds the beauty of my emotions at the time. Even if I look right. back in those jokes and I'm like, actually, I don't really find that funny. Like the Hangover movies. There's a lot right. of like transphobic shit in the Hangover movies. But I can go back and I can watch it. And I can sit down and well, there's a fantastic quote recently that I saw, which was, we need to be on head nodding terms with our past selves, even if they don't make pleasant company. And uh-huh. I can get back into the mental space of me when I was watching those movies. Hangover 1 was 2009, so I was like 11. Um, and I was like, I can get back into that space and watch this as it was and say, oh, wow, they just used an F slur that I would never use now. I'm not going to laugh at it because I don't find it funny. And this later joke in the movie still does make me laugh. Like, oh, wow, that's still a, a kind of a funny enough setup. And I don't mm-hmm. have to view it with the same amount of love or reverence. But I can appreciate, I can be on head nodding terms with the past of how far we've come. Um, but like, even with, um, especially with Monty Python, like, Monty Python is a foundation in my comedic, um, like, in my comedic desires. Like, everything Pon- Python did, even the subsequent shows that were inspired by them, like uh, Fry and Lowry, like, Yes, the people who did them are often terrible and shit, but if they made me feel a specific way, those emotions are mine. They don't belong to that person. I don't have right, to yeah. I don't have to stop liking something just because the person 
Like, the person who created this piece of media is a shit. Yes, but the emotions that that piece of media created in me, there's one step removed. I no longer have to, I'm not obliged to say, oh, well, you know, I actually quite like Family Guy. Like, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't watch it now because, again, my comedic t- tastes have changed. They, they become, like, why would I listen to, like, a cis white guy tell those stories when I can listen to a lot of diverse creators tell those very specific right, yeah, found families? Yeah. But... If Family Guy's on the TV and there's nothing else to watch, I'll watch an episode of Family Guy. I'll watch an episode of South Park. I'll watch, like, whatever. It doesn't bother me that that there is elements in the, like, because I, I don't have to laugh. Nobody's like, you know, I'm not being forced mm-hmm. to laugh at something. I can just be like, yeah, this meant a lot to me when I needed it to mean a lot to me. And I don't right. know. I just went on a bit of a rant there. I'm sorry. Um, no, 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 no. That I appreciate it. Yeah, I, like these things are really intrinsic to how we view the world. I, I don't think it's right to jettison things. And I also don't think that it's right to jettison people's opinions from long ago. Like one thing I found quite questionable was James Gunn uh, like made some really right. shitty yeah. fucking things. He said some really fucking shitty things. But then he mm-hmm. spent the next eight years of his career making, st- telling stories with diverse people in them telling stories which were like actively against the thing the joke that he made uh like doing better and telling stories where the people who he mocked were actually quite like and uh, let's not say james gunn is the best person in the world he's not but sure you gotta have the parity of well in eight years i changed so I have to assume that this person who seems genuinely sorry and who never did anything like that again will change as well. Now, that's not true of everyone, but I like to assume the benefit of the doubt that people are going to change as much as I will. Uh, and I'm sometimes proven wrong, but it's nice to live in a world, as you said earlier, with hope. It, uh, like, right. it, I, I like to think that people can get better and shouldn't be precluded because that was one of my biggest fears. Because like, when you're a teenager, you say and do stupid things. And I, mm-hmm. my fear with starting this show was, oh, that someone will remember something I said when I was 15 and that's it, game over. I'm like, yeah, mm, yeah, 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 totally. No, so that's, yeah, I know exactly how you feel. And that's kind of why earlier I was admitting like, oh, yeah, no, when I was in my 20s, when I was in my 20s, I really thought that I was like this progressive idiot and I was just a complete asshole and I didn't even know it. You know, there was a lot of shit that I bought into because I, I, <laughs> I, I was 100% like one of these one of these idiots that goes online pr- professing to appreciate women, but then is telling them to smile all the time. You know, that stupid shit like that, like awful cringy shit. That was me in my twenties, hundred percent. I wasn't as overt. I wasn't like, I wasn't somebody who was very vocal about it, but that's certainly how I used to think. And um, there's no way I would have gotten to where I am now if I hadn't accepted that I needed to grow. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 100% like who I am today. I own who – there's this old saying in Bushido, own every word you speak. And I absolutely own everything I've said because if I hadn't gone through the processes that I had, I'm certain I would never have grown into who I am now. Who's not perfect? I'm still learning. I'm sure in five years I'll be like, oh, yeah, I remember I used to think this one thing. Like, yeah. I'll probably laugh about the fact that I didn't want to wave the, the LBGTQ flag because I didn't feel like I had, a, you know, a place. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, that wasn't mine to be a part of or some shit like that. I'll look back and be like, oh, man, yeah, I was such a baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're allowed to be human. We're allowed to be. Yeah. This is like my fundamental core. Like, the person who I was when I was 18, I'm 22 now, the person when uh-huh. I was 18 was a person very steeped in a lot of things that she didn't want to accept about herself, a lot of things that mm-hmm. she wasn't yet comfortable with. And I had a lot of beliefs that she thought she should think uh, and had a lot of experiences which now seem foreign. And that's not to say I was a bastard or whatever. I was human. Like, I was I was kind. I was loving. I, I remain on nodding terms with the person I was in the past, I, even if they're not pleasant company. And it's okay. It, like, I'm okay. I, I just have that sense of you're okay like even if what you said was six days ago and you're like actually no i need to learn now and i've done something wrong and i'm not sure what i've done but i need to learn i'm like okay perfect great you have you have my respect that not as much respect as you lost for doing the shitty thing but you have at least reclaimed some respect from me that you're willing to be educated and you're willing to be 
you know, taught how you're wrong. And that's cool because being wrong is the best thing ever. Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, it's <laughs> maybe it's just me. What is beautiful? When you randomly just land that headshot with Hanzo and you don't even mean to. Like, yes. And it's a Widowmaker across the stage. And she's, she's just out. She's out playing the hell out of you. There's no sh- You should not be challenging her. She's going to kill your ass. But you peek out anyway and just let off a random shot and hope to God it lands. And you hear that dinging noise and she dies with 100 points on it because you just headshot her. That is just, man, that is, that is gorgeous. That is like one of the most gratifying, wonderful things. I, I know Chloe and I always ask her. I'm like... Do, do you get a lot of frustrated players talking to you because she does the voice of Widowmaker and she's like, she's like, there's so many, the fans of Overwatch are so kind to her, but she's like, people do get really frustrated because they're either unmitigated gods at, at Widowmaker or they're awful because she's so hard to use. And <laughs> she's like, for some reason, fans like to visit that on the voiceover actors, but they've always been very kind to her. But I love having that conversation because every now and then I'll just bring up, I'm like, Chloe, I, I cannot stand your character. I cannot stand <laughs> <laughs> and she just she'll laugh about it but like uh, i always it cracks me up would you describe yourself as cute and cuddly mm, i'm definitely cuddly um i i i think i i connect to people and i think <laughs> i think that physical contact is how i really connect with people in my life so this quarantine has sucked um but uh i don't i i've never really when it comes to like my physical appearance of any kind of any kind i rely upon others to tell me like uh what what do you think <laughs> like so i'm like okay if i see a picture of myself and i'm like oh this might be a good picture because i've seen other people react to it so i'll let them decide so i have no compass i, I really don't i'm like i i have no sense of style i have no compass i'm i just have to go off of like assuming and this is this is wreaked havoc and like my dating life in general, because uh, I, I don't, I have no idea if someone finds me attractive or cute or whatever. I have no idea. And it's so hard for me to re signal sometimes. So I'm just like, I guess maybe. Mm-hmm. Like, if I look, I, 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 I go off my cup, like in this case, I would be like, well, I, I think Sam thinks I'm cute. So I think I'll go with yes. <laughs> so that's kind of where I fall on that. Where do you feel safest? Mm. Um, uh, maybe back home on the farm. Um, my, my folks live in East Texas. It's three hours from the nearest airport. It is out in the middle of like, it, it would, it's near the borders of Oklahoma, Louisiana, and Arkansas. So that is the deep south. And it's that one part of Texas that would be considered the deep south because it's so close to those three borders. Um, and they live out in a small community in the middle of freaking nowhere. More people went to my high school that live in the town that my parents go that live in. And uh, out there, it's just really quiet. Um, everyone knows everyone. You can walk around, which I don't get to do here in Los Angeles too often. Um, but you can walk around. The air is clean. Um, the only thing you have to look out for are snakes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really I love it out there the quiet is just amazing and uh, i always i've always felt really safe and distant from the world out there if you were on a starship what position would you hold i would want to be a doctor a doctor or a counselor i would i think it, a position where the bedrock of what it is that i'm committed to doing is taking care of people would be how i would want to contribute to the team so anytime somebody offers to play like hey i want to run star trek adventures i'm like i call doctor I'm calling the doctor character right now. I would love to be like a brilliant medical officer on a starship that just kept everyone healthy with some, with somebody who could go into dangerous situations and the enemy wouldn't immediately open fire on me because I was there to also heal them as well. Like I always loved the episodes where Beverly Crusher was going into like a dangerous situation and she was just frustratingly stubborn about like helping everyone (laughs) and picard would be like beverly please pull your head out of your ass we need you back on the ship right now and like she would just be like nope i'm gonna stay here and help people like or or bones he would kind of do the same thing like as as grizzled as he was his first priority was always taking care of the idiots that he was trying to save (laughs) (laughs) like 
I, I love the di- I love the juxtaposition of somebody who is just like biting down hard and getting the job done because people's lives can be saved. I mm-hmm. I think it's a heroic thing, and I would love to be. I, I my favorite class is the player support classes typically, and if I could be on a starship as, as a support class, that'd be rad. What is a feeling or experience you've had which does not have a word that you wish did? <laughs> It's funny because when it comes to these instances and I can't find a word for something, I immediately find a sensation to describe it. Um, so it's like the, the, one of the biggest challenges I have is when I'm being a storyteller, sometimes I'll forget, but most of the times I'm remembering to describe how things smell at the table, but I'm trying to find a way to also describe it to Sam, who has no sense of smell. So I've got to capture what it is to describe things omitting what the smell sensation is and focusing on the physical sensation of getting a smell in your nose. So like if the air is heavy what does that smell like? It, 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 like what's the sensation of breathing that in? You can feel the heaviness of the air in the back of your nostrils. You can tell that there is a thickness or Maybe there's a, a biting sensation in the sinuses, like you've just inhaled something that's kind of having a reaction while everyone else is covering their faces. You know it's a bad smell is in the room. Um, I've always wanted to find um, words that, that can describe s- sensations that are not necessarily available to other people as a way of like capturing uh, their experience with it. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I've, always wanted, I've always wanted to find a word and I haven't had, like, there, of course, I've had sensations where I don't experience smell. Like, if it's really cold and all you can smell is cold, <laughs> um, I've always wanted to find words that can help illustrate that. What is uh, the smell of cold? Because now that really, you mention it's, it's, it. Yeah, it, people, people always talk about the smell of cold, but what it really is is a sensation. It's not actually a scent. It's the air is so chilled that it's not giving you any information when you breathe it in. There's no real scent in the air. It's just this cold, almost numbing wind that just goes into the back of your sinuses. And, and, it kinda, and, and the, the sensation of that air warming up as soon as it enters your head kind of confuses your sense a little bit. All you know is that it's really cold outside. And then you start losing the ability of being able to track whether or not your nose is running. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's interesting like that, but being able to capture that. I've encountered those senses before. I wish I, could, I wish I could describe, like, I wish I could find a word that I could just immediately pull and describe sensations like that for people who don't necessarily. As a narrator, I, that's what I would love to be able to do. Do you think there is more good than bad in the world? Yes. Yes, I do, absolutely. Yeah. For every story you hear about a suicide bomber, there's a kid being born to a loving family. I mean, for every time you hear um, something awful or tragic or ridiculous, the stories that are getting missed are a father who accepts that his son is gay. There's so many things that are going on right now that are happening every single little bitty moment. And I get really incensed about this sometimes, especially when it comes to arguments about Star Wars and light and dark. (laughs) Because I think it is, it, it, the, the universe is in a constant state of construction and deconstruction. And I feel like the act of creation and the act of goodness is intrinsic. I mean, as a Buddhist, I'm going to be informed by the fact that I think from the moment we are all born, there is an inclination towards kindness and compassion. And that, you know, it reminds me of that, um, that beautiful lyric in the Arcade Fire song uh, that, children don't grow up our bodies get bigger but our hearts get torn up um it's kind of the same philosophy of like we 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 are naturally born to like wanting a a parental care and to uh, like we have a natural inclination towards compassion and love that sometimes we are we lose that but i i think that intrinsically rooted in human nature is that that inclination, that desire for. I mean, and, it, and, it, and sometimes it's haunting. Like, I'll never forget one of the most disturbing things I saw during my, my research, because I did a dissertation ages ago. Well, I shouldn't call it a dissertation. I wasn't going for a PhD or anything, but I did a, I did a, um, I did a paper uh, on World War II. And I'll remember, I'll never forget, like, one of the most disturbing things 
was watching this recently colorized footage of Hitler talking to this little girl. And they were at his estate somewhere in like the Alps or wherever the hell. And he was being so kind and so sweet to her and making her giggle. And seeing that human moment was disturbing because it reminded that the monster was very much a human being capable of acts of kindness and tenderness and compassion. And it, it, it was just, it was really disturbing for me to see that. It's so much easier to think of this man as a cartoon caricature of an evil, of like pure wretched evil, which he was. <laughs> um, uh, as Eddie Izzard would say, he was a, a fuckhead or a shithead, as many famous historians have said. Um, so um, there is, there is, I do carry the belief that, that deep down that that is, uh, that is ever present. And so I, it, it makes me believe that by default, that with all the cruelty and inhumanity that takes place, that by its foundations, the reason why we have managed to move forward throughout society is because the undercurrents of all these abhorrent things that happen every day, there is still a, strong, a stronger sense of good and goodwill. I mean, that was really present in the United States after September 11th. It lasted only a little while, sadly. <laughs> before uh, the dark side started reeling its head and and fear became where we reacted from. But it was incredible for about a week after that event, people, the kindness that everyone was showing each other suddenly. We had been shaken out of our complacency and the kindness, I'll never forget, like in Los Angeles, people being so kind, like, I'm sorry, were you in line? Like, it was, it was unbelievable. Everyone was united and, like, really woke the fuck up. It lasted about a week. But, and then, and then, uh, and then the narrative about being terrified of Muslims started becoming part of discourse. And then we were off to the races. I think, I, I think we just need to be woken up from that complacency. And I, I just hope that we reach a point where it doesn't take tragedy to, to do it anymore. <laughs> If you could give just one piece of advice, what would that be? I'm thinking about all of the great pieces of advice that have been given to me um, that have really stuck with me over the years. <laughs> just like going through a catalog of things that I've learned, some of them pretentious, some of them authentic, some of them like valuable. Um, there's so many things that could be said for an answer like this, but I think the one that's more applicable to where I have been traveling throughout life is something that a woman named Ann Bogart once said. She wrote a book called The Director Prepares Seven Essays on Art and the Theater. And it mostly focuses on acting and theater and directing. But if you read that book, what you realize is she is talking about self-expression, much like if you read the first half of the Tao Jeet Kune Do by Bruce Lee, you realize he's talking about art. He's talking about self-expression, and it's applicable to everyday life and everything that you do, and being more authentic, and waking up to your own authenticity, and like realizing that this invented state of being that you're existing is, is, is a puppet play. You're playing a role, and waking up to who you really are is a simple matter of putting it down and learning how to put it down. There's this wonderful quote in, in Bogart's book where she's talking about specifically how we create excuses for ourselves because of fear to avoid becoming who we are or doing what we're compelled to do. And in this case, work or like creating art. And one of the things that she said that I constantly tell people as a piece of advice is she says, don't wait for the right circumstances to create. Work with what you have right now. The quality and the fulfillment of your future endeavors will be determined by what you're doing right now. She's really pointing at the fact you should not, don't, don't wait until you have enough money. Don't wait until you have the right equipment or you have the right story idea. What you do right now matters. So start, just start doing. If you can't think of anything to write, write about how you can't think of anything to write. Um, if, you, if you can't, like if you're not coming up with a good game that you want to play, create, create a world where there are no games. 
uh, or like, you know what I mean? Like do, just do something, but work with whatever you, whatever it is that you have right now. If you have the compulsion to create or to express, don't wait for circumstances to match this idea you have in your head of where it will fit.